Pete Weiner, Melody Barnes, thank you both for being here. I was interested that there was one person's name that did not come up in this discussion. And I remember that there were discussions in the summer that Mr. our president, um, in recruiting a person to serve as his vice presidential candidate, uh, said, I'm really going to leave the, the presidency to you to manage as the CEO, and I'm just going to be the chairman of the board. And yet, in the discussion we just had about how management will go on, there was no reference to Mr. Pence. Yeah, uh, there, uh, there weren't, and that's, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's an unknowable question. I, I think that my, my hunch is the way that this is going to uh, break down is that Mike Pence is going to have some amount of influence on a certain number of issues. Um, so, for example, I think that the Betsy DeVos nomination was, was driven uh, by recommendations by, by Pence. My guess is that on the judicial side, the Supreme Court appointments, that Pence will have, uh, will have a fair amount of influence there. So I do think that a kind of uh, division of, of, uh, of labor will, um, will happen. Um, the vice presidents, uh, over time, have gotten increasingly um, influential. Uh, you, you know, the bucket of warm spit, as, as, as the <laughs> phrase was, back in, in, in the, uh, the, the 20th uh, century. But really, um, you know, if you went with Al Gore, he was the most influential vice president at that time. Uh, and then Cheney was more influential than, than Gore. Uh, Biden, I don't know if he was more influential than Cheney, but he was certainly a, a, an influential um, figure. Um, and the other thing where I think Pence is going to be important is in relations and negotiations, not just with Democrats, but also Republicans. That he is the person, because he used to be a House member, and so he's the, the, the individual that they're sending to Capitol Hill uh, to, to, to speak to Ryan and, um, and to, uh, to McConnell. Uh, so he could be an influential uh, figure, um, but we just don't know, and we don't know there, there are intrinsic limitations to how much influence a vice president can have, um, and the president has to empower him. And then there's there's a White House staff, which can which can uh, uh, you know in, impede. Um, but like so much of of the Trump presidency, um, there's just uh, you know for most uh, presidencies you have a sense of the direction that it's going to go in, and I think in this case. We, we don't know, and we're just going to have to wait and see how, um, how things unfold. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I think by virtue of some of the positions that we did mention, you know, the chief of staff is typically enormously powerful. Um, the head of legislative affairs is the person who just spends their life sitting on, on the Hill. So I think those we look to those, or I, at least I was thinking about those positions as naturally being um, engaged in the day to day. But I, I do think you're right. Um, and certainly the role that Pence has played as the, uh, in some ways, the interpreter <laughs> of Trump um, to the Hill. President. I'm sorry? This is a novel president. In, in every way. Uh, thank you both. Pete and Melody have been so generous to the Miller Center over the years in participating in our oral histories. Uh, I was able to uh, have the honor of interviewing Pete for the Bush 43 and wasn't here when Melody did her interview for the uh, Edward Kennedy oral history, but we're so grateful to them for that and continue to share their time and their talents and their knowledge with us. So at the end, as you were both talking about uh, the things that uh, Trump could do uh, early in his presidency uh, to be the president of all the people, and Pete mentioned the guardrails and the norms of the presidency, and uh, Melody talked about the things that he could say. Um, I, we get a lot of questions here, as you can imagine, at this time every four years about the inaugural and about the upcoming inauguration. And so I just, as almost a free association, wrote down the words that came to mind as I think of inaugurations, and they were decorum, tradition, historical norms, dignity, grace, elegance, and eloquence. <laughs> And so when I'm asked by media to 
predict what this inauguration will be like. I don't know what to say. So I'm turning to you, the experts. What do you think this will be like? It, and if you just want to confine yourself to the inaugural address, that's perfectly fine. But if you want to speak more broadly than that about the symbols and the imagery and the norms and the traditions, I'd be most interested. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I, <laughs> even given everything that we've been talking about, I actually think that the tradition um, and kind of the trappings of the inauguration um, provide enormous guardrails on what that day will look like. And I expect it to, in many ways, look like inaugurations past. I mean, obviously, the content of the inaugural address um, will, you know, that, that's all on the president-elect. Um, but I think I actually, I, I think that it will, it will in many ways stick to script. I mean, but for the inaugural address, and that's a great big but for, right? But, but for that, I mean, it is much, much of it is visual. Um, and, you know, the president-elect walking out, standing, taking the oath, you know, skip over the address, you know, the ride, walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, the watching the parade, the going to the balls. Um, a lot of that is, is simply visual. So a lot of the content of the inaugural address will obviously matter a great deal. And in fact, also the visual of the crowd and who's there and what we are hearing from the crowd and color commentary from the crowd, I think, will, will shape that day. Um, and my, I could be really, really wrong. I, I expect that he will try to keep it within parameters. I think he will want to look very, very presidential um, at that moment, um, so I, I don't ex I don't expect something that will fly way 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 out of bounds. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I I agree with Nelly. I um, let me put it this way: if he can't stay within parameters for two days, then we're in worse shape than even I think we are. Um, this uh, th uh, I I think and I hope he can keep it uh, together and stay off of Twitter at least, um, you know, antagonistic um, Twitter. Um, I think he will, um, and I think he probably will do so for his own self-interest. So I think he'll be contained. Um, my expectations for the speech are not high. I think it'll be a relatively pedestrian speech, and I don't think it'll be well delivered. Um, I think his temptation will be to go off script. Uh, he has a very hard time uh, reading um, uh, uh, speeches off of teleprompters. This isn't a long speech, or we hope it's not a long speech. Tradition, tra traditionally, inaugural addresses are not. Um, you know, if he's smart, he's going to take the, 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 um, the impressions of him that are out there that are negative and try and recast them in a positive way, and in a sense sort of give voice to what people think about him, but to describe himself in a more kind of, you know, I'm rough around the edges, but, you know, it's because I care passionately about, or something like that. For these things to be effective, you can't give a speech that is completely uh, discordant with what people think you are, uh, and people have a pretty good sense of, of what he is. But rhetoric is not his gift, uh, and it's not the gift of the people uh, who, who are around him. And, and I mean, the test of that is when he gave his speech when he won the election, uh, it was it was a, a perfectly mediocre speech, and people were falling over themselves talking about how you know impressive it was for him because he didn't go you know berserk against against people. I do think that there are, um, in terms of the surrounding of the event, they're going to be uh, it's going to be more problematic than for most presidencies. For one thing, you're going to have an awful lot of Democrats who are not going to attend. Uh, his uh, exchange with uh, John Lewis uh, didn't help that cause. And there is an effort on the part of Democrats to say that his presidency is illegitimate. And one of the ways they're going to sh show that they think it's illegitimate is they're going to boycott the, um, the inaugural address. Whether you think that's a good idea or not, it's, it's going to be um, difficult. And you know how to, we know how Donald Trump is. If he feels that he has been attacked or insulted, he tends to, to try and punch back a uh, hundred times harder than, than the punch thrown at him. 
So that'll be interesting whether that can be contained. The other thing is there's going to be a huge march in Washington the day following the, uh, the, the inaugural. So the inaugural address is on Friday and Saturday you're going to have a lot of people. It's a, it's a, a women's march that's, uh, I don't know if it's explicitly or subtext anti-Trump, but that's going to be there. That's unusual uh, to, to have that. So it's just a contentious time. Uh, I think even apart from Donald Trump, uh, you know, pre, pre-Trump on the political stage, there's just a rancor in, in American politics and a kind of anger and bitterness, some of it understandable, some of it not. Um, but that was, that was the kindling, and he's the match. And um, so uh, we'll see. I think it'll fade away very, very soon. I don't think he'll give a speech that's at all memorable. I, if, if anybody remembers any lines from it, you know, three weeks after it's given, I'd be, I'd be surprised unless it's in a negative, you know, context. Do you know who's writing it? Stephen Miller, I think, is, is the, who used to be a Sessions uh, aide. So he's, he's involved with it. Um, one of, I'm not sure if, if you'd say it's a problem, but because of the antipathy of, of Republicans, a lot of Republicans who have worked in previous administrations, they just don't have a lot of people who have done this before. Um, and, and also just in terms of governing in the White House. Um, and I'm not in favor of retreads. You know, people like me don't have to, I've, 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 I've done my thing. So, uh, and others, um, and I, Lord knows I wouldn't work there even if, if I was asked, and, and Lord knows I won't be asked. Um, but it does help to have people who have a kind of institutional memory know their way around, uh, you know, <laughs> the EOB and the White House and know how to deal with, um, with, um, with Congress. I want to thank both of you for uh, coming down here. Your insights were uh, particularly helpful. Uh, I'm a law student here at the University of Virginia, but I grew up in Rochester, New York, a community that 50, 60 years ago, right, was the household name of Kodak and Xerox and Bausch and Lam. And every time I go back home, I'm reminded of the fact that that community has changed a lot. And the anxiety that was brought up in the opening remarks tonight is very much felt when I'm at home, and I can understand why uh, Mr. Trump found supporting communities like my hometown because of that. But I think about the problems that were not discussed tonight. Automation was mentioned, but I think about when we think about the American dream, the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that certainly is preventing many, many people in this country from being able to reach the American dream but it seems like that's an issue that's symptomatic of something deeper, right? right? The, what I think of what Tocqueville talks about and Arthur Brooks talks about and some others, uh, the, the social capital that, that uh, Robert Putnam talks about in Bowling Alone. And that to me seems much more difficult for Mr. Trump and the Republicans and Democrats in Congress to be able to solve because that's at a community level. Right. Um, so I'd love if you could talk about just how to address something like that because automation going forward is gonna be an issue for my generation. And this opioid crisis, again, an issue for my generation. It doesn't seem like it's as easy to solve as tax reform or infrastructure or repealing or replacing the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. One of the things I will start out by saying is that I agree with you about the symptom, and it's a significant and damaging and deeply concerning symptom that the opioid crisis represents. I think there is also an opportunity to look back, um, and it's not, it is, it is a helpful lesson because of what we didn't do, and recognize that this isn't the first time that the country has dealt with this kind of crisis. I mean, we saw the prevalence of drug addiction in communities of color decades ago, and we characterized it differently, we responded to it differently, and we whistled by it um, and now it is taking form and taking root in other communities, and we have an opportunity to try and address some of the same concerns that really communities of color were the miners' canary for many, many years ago. And I think it represents um, a sense of hopelessness. Um, I think it represents um, the concerns that we have about lack of opportunity um, and lack of mobility that are now deeply rooted in many communities across the country. And there are 
there are policy issues that we can, um, or policies that we can use to start to address some of those issues. But I also think that it, re it represents the need for what we were talking about at the end of what things can we do to bring, help Americans come back to a common sense of calling a sense of the common good and a sense of community um, that has so desperately been lost. So there are things that we can do to help people literally as a health matter deal with their addictions. There are things that we can do like uh, not use our criminal justice system to continue to fracture families and throw people away for long periods of time um, that we've tried before um, that I think would be important. But I think there's something deeper about the American ideal and the American experiment that we also have to address um, if we're going to deal with some of the issues that you're talking about. It's a much bigger issue than that we're, what we're touching on, but I want to give Pete a chance to speak to that as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it was very eloquently um, presented. Um, I think you're, you're quite right. Um, let me deal with first this issue of, of um, the uh, uh, the feelings that, that you were um, conveying in terms of your your hometown and what's gone on. And that's very real, right? And so if you read everyone from J.D. Vance to Arlie Hochschild, uh, J J Hill Hillbilly Elegy, which J.D. Vance wrote, and um, Arlie Hochschild did a book called Strangers in Their Own Land, um, they speak to something that, that really is real, and this is, uh, I, I made an allusion earlier to, to Bob Putnam and, and Charles Murray and this kind of coming, coming apart. So the suffering is real um, and, uh, and difficult, and it is a kind of class divide. Um, and it's, it is complicated because these are, this, this is a product of automation uh, and, and globalization and uh, the fracturing of families. Uh, and uh, the destruction of communities and civic civic bonds, and it's very very complicated because broken families can accelerate um, communities coming apart, and jobs leaving, and jobs leaving can accelerate families breaking apart because of the pressure and the stress. And you just have to go through, and, and as you I begin to identify what these problems are, th there's a range of options and, 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 and capacity for government to address them. So if you're talking about uh, drugs and drug addiction, that, uh, that's something that government has some power over. Uh, you know, when Bill Bennett was, was drug czar, he worked with Joe Biden closely in the late 80s and, and early 90s. She did some work with Ted Kennedy as well where there was a very comprehensive effort on law enforcement, on addiction, or on treatment, on a whole range of issues, and drug use went down uh, sharply in a remarkably short period of time. Now, it wasn't simply public policy that did that. The crack, crack epidemic, which was really hitting in the mid-'80s and ravaging communities, kind of ran itself out as a kind of, uh, of, of fire. But so on, on, on drug use uh, and on crime, government can, can do a, a lot. And Melanie and I may have some, some difference. I think probably the prison that she comes through is, is, is the incarceration and, and the criminal justice system being, uh, being very problematic. I accept some of that. On the other hand, I think that one of the extraordinary achievements in the last 20 years has been the drop in violent crime, which actually has been the greatest gift to the communities that are poorest. Um, and so if you look at the murder rate of New York when it was over to about 2,200 in, uh, in, in 93, and now we're, you're at a little over 300. Uh, so I actually think that uh, overall, while there have been some collateral effects, I think uh, the, the crime is a big deal. But in any event, whether one agrees with that or not, that's something government has a capacity to deal with. The fracturing of families, if government can fix that, um, I don't know what it is. We've tried this. Um, uh, both Republican and Democratic administrations. Certainly, I think, as far as the federal government, the capacity to do that is limited. There are programs uh, y where, where you go through, uh, like in Chattanooga, uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of local programs where a lot of good is, is, is happening in terms of, of civic engagement to help families. But in the end, um, this, these are a lot, frankly, of the issue of, um, of the human heart um, and, uh, uh, and government's ability to, to, to shape <laughs> the human heart 
is and, and ought to be and will always be limited. Um, and, um, and then there are just things you, c you can do. It seems to me when you, when you, when you think through these problems facing uh, blue collar and low income families, you know, there's, there are immediate things you can do uh, of which you could, I would say, earned income tax credits, so wage subsidies, relocation subsidies, uh, and um, uh, payroll, cut the payroll tax. Uh, you, can, you can do that kind of thing. On, on marriage, you can get rid of, you know, penalties for marriage and, and incentives uh, not to marry. You can do that kind of thing. I think in the middle term, um, you can uh, take um, education is a big deal. You've got to, we're not going to go back. I mean, all this talk that people say about returning manufacturing jobs, that's not going to happen. Uh, automation is, is the chief driver of this. You know, if you were in the horse and buggy industry and the automobile came, you're not going to bring it back. That's the way it works. And you can't reverse globalization even if you wanted to. We have gone from an extraordinary and anomalous period when America was in the post-World War II period and for a long time after where we were the top manufacturing and high-skill economy in the world. That wasn't going to last because all the other Western democracies were flat on their back. We are increasingly a high-skill economy. Uh, and uh, what you've got to do is you've got to prepare students uh, of, to be able to compete in that economy while helping the people whose lives are being dislocated and in some, dis in some extent uh, destroyed. You've got to help through that transition time. Um, but eventually, over the long term, you've got to understand where the economy is going. And it's not all the economy, but, but we, there are some levers that government has that, that it doesn't have when it comes to, to the breakdown of the family. Um, and education is a is is a big part of that, and that raises a whole you know list of issues about uh, about education um, reform. Anyway, I, my point here is it's complicated, um, and um, <laughs> and nobody does anybody a service if they pretend that it's easy. Um, You're uh, the, the conservative intellectual you've referred to a couple times tonight, Charles Murray, is an advocate for a very substantial guaranteed uh, income right. for every American family. Uh, begin to sound like a liberal Democrat. Um, the, um, uh, I think we have worn everyone out, and we have to stop. Uh, but uh, and if someone would like, would like to ask a question of our guests um, uh, after we've broken up, that's fine. But thank you all again. Uh, it's really been a great conversation. <laughs>